Good morning and welcome to Ambassador Baptist Church. Looks like we got a house full this morning. Praise the Lord. We've got others that are following us live stream via Facebook. We're glad that they're here with us and others coming in. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We'll just make ourselves at home. Find you a seat best you can. We need to put some things together for our visitors. We will. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we are grateful and thankful for this beautiful day. Thank you for the good crowd this morning, for all the visitors. Thank you for the safe trip for Brother CJ and his family. Pray that you be with Miss Leanne as she's flying uh, to Alabama this morning. Give her safe travels and be with the family that lost the loved one. Pray that you'll meet with us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. You know the routine. you got to put a smile on your face. Grab a songbook and sing. Amen. We got extra choir members over here this morning, so that'll be good. Y'all find 179 while we're getting everybody comfortably seated. 179. Let Jesus come into your heart. Sunday. We're going to honor all of our graduates, all one of them that we know of, and any others that might be in the service. Uh, Brother Isaac is still in school, correct, finishing up, so we've been praying for him and Miss Rachel both, and so we're going to honor all of our graduates next week and uh, just recognize them. Then a week from this Wednesday, the 28th, Brother CJ will be preaching Wednesday night. My wife's taking me on vacation, <laughs> antiquing. <laughs> May 2nd, Brother Paul Sharon's son, Hunter, who is teamed up with Brother CJ now. They work together remodeling and doing the church work and stuff. He will be here that Sunday morning and Sunday night preaching for you. I've not heard him preach. Brother CJ has, and so I'm going by faith. Um, the word of Brother CJ, amen, but he's good. His dad pastors down in Hillsboro, pastors the Bible Baptist Church. Is that right? And so uh, Hunter's been raised right, taught right, and I have not worried one bit. Amen. Amen. Might even learn something. <laughs> so, but we'll be gone for that week from the 25th through June 2nd. And so I'm looking forward to having a vacation. So keep all those things in mind. Then we come back and it's Mother's Day on the 9th of May. So this beer is going by fast. It'll be over before you know it. We'll be into 2022. Amen. How long am I going to be gone? From April 25th till June. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You caught that, didn't you? I tried, you know. A nice little vacation. 
But uh, we'll, we'll get a time away and get refreshed, amen? Maybe the fish will be biting, I don't know. We told you about that, was it Wednesday night about the fish and I've done, you know? So, but God is good, amen? Amen. And so my dad, as far as I know, is just relaxing, trying to get the legs back to normal. Brother Kim, not too good, so keep praying for Brother Kim. And uh, keep praying for Tasha. She went to the hospital yesterday with uh, strep problems. I know she was running a fever in the morning. I don't know. And I, I saw Philip yesterday, but um, I didn't hear back from him last mm -hmm. night. So keep praying for her as well with her health issues. Amen? And pray for one another. Yeah, amen. If for no other reason, because God told us to. Yeah. And you need it. Amen? <laughs> and I need it. Don't we all? We all need it. <laughs> Let's do number 213. 213. Savior like a shepherd lead us. <laughs> safe travels. Kashan has to go back and take some tests and to graduate. Is that correct? <laughs> you got what? Got it. Okay, he graduates next year. I'm trying to get you through there. <laughs> so you listen to them as they're our special this morning.
God knows what he's doing. Amen. How many believe that God can bring those guys in from Odessa to sing a song that goes exactly with the message? Because mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened. But see, David, did I tell you what I was preaching on today? God knows what he's doing. Amen. Amen. Turn this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. We're only going to be looking at one verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2. Now, I happen to know, because pastors know these things, everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to be a part of something that is successful, if you're honest, amen? So I had to ask myself the question, and the outline is in your bulletin. First of all, I had to ask myself the question, what does successful mean? Because if you ask everybody in here what is successful, we'll get a different answer pretty much from everybody. Right. So that being said, I thought I would go with two things, the dictionary and the Bible. Amen? That's right. The dictionary says that successful means accomplishing an aim or purpose to be victorious or fortunate. And so, successful me give it to you again. That's fine if you want to. <laughs> Accomplishing an aim or a purpose. In other words, you set out to do something, and if you accomplish that, then you're successful. Mm -hmm. Or victorious. Who doesn't want to be a successful parent? Right. All of us that have kids want to be successful parents, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be successful? Does it mean that your kids grow up to be doctors and lawyers and preachers and teachers? If your son is still bagging groceries at Brookshire's at 28 years of age, is that successful? Did you raise them successful? If your children haven't come to Christ yet and received them as their Savior, are you a successful parent? What determines successful? All of us would like to be successful husbands and wives, would we not? I mean, what determines a successful husband or wife? Does that mean that you don't ever have any problems in your marriage? 
If that's the case, I doubt we have any successful marriages. Amen? Because we all have problems, do we not? Are you a successful wife if your husband doesn't attend church with you? Are you a successful husband if your wife won't let you buy that Dodge Charger that you've always wanted? <laughs> How do we determine success? There's many different ways. That's the second point. How do we determine success anyway? Now, many people determine success by comparing themselves with other people. If I got more money than you, if I got more toys than you, if I've got a bigger home than you, if I've got more possessions than you, then I'm successful. That's how the world kind of looks at success today. Right. Who's got the most? They think, if I can't buy more than what my neighbor has, then I'm not successful. And they think they're a failure. Some people think that you're not successful if you haven't climbed further above the ladder than anybody else. And how many people climb that ladder and knock other people off the ladder just to get to the top of the ladder? Mm -hmm. We see that in our world today, do we not? Mm -hmm. Some pastors even have problems with that. Mm -hmm. Not me. Some pastors determine their success by how many people they have in their church, the size of their church. Some of them, the number of baptisms that they have every year, they keep record of it. Some of them by their salary. Some of them by their prestige in the community and how well they're known and how when you say their name, either they smile or they swing at you. You know what I mean? And there are some pastors that do that, maybe even by the vehicles that they drive. And we know how some of those guys are, amen? Amen. So how do we determine success? I have decided that I want to give you a verse that might help you determine success. Keep that in mind now, the word success. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found successful. No? Doesn't say successful? So the Lord's not looking for successful people? Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Amen. Now, the word required there means essential. It's essential. We've heard a lot the word essential, essential workers, essential this, that, and the other in the last year, year and a half, have we not? And so it, it, it's vital, it's necessary. So the verse says, moreover, it's, it's essential, it's required, it's necessary in stewards. The word steward is one that manages his or own, her own household. How many of you believe that your body, if you're saved, is a temple of the Holy Spirit of God? Amen. And so you are to take care of that household. You are a steward of that household. <laughs> so this verse says that it is required of you, the stewards, to be what? Found faithful. So God's not looking for success. God's looking for faithfulness. Is he not? It's going to be a long one, I can tell you. <laughs> so it doesn't say that a steward is required to be successful, but to be faithful. So that's what I want us to look at. Because see, God looks at success differently than we do. When we think about success... We look at the money and the houses and the cars and the clothes and what they have and what they're doing, all that they can accomplish. That's what we look at. That's not how God looks at it. God's looking for faithfulness. What does it say? That a man be found faithful. Now, let me answer some of those questions that I raised a minute ago to see how we do. Does it mean you're a failure as a parent if your children don't turn out the way that you expect them to? No. No. Raise up a child in the way it should go, he or she should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. In other words, be faithful to God and raise up your children the way God wants them to be raised up. And the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Right. And so if your children didn't turn out the way you wanted them to turn out, that doesn't mean that you're a failure. Right. If you've been serving God faithfully and raising them the way God commanded us to raise them, you've been a good Christian parent. How about husbands and wives? That's always a good subject, is it not? <laughs> Are you a failure if your husband or your wife hadn't been turned out and trained and doing what you want them to do 
like you try to train them to do, all that they should or he should or she should be, according to you. Not if your marriage has been based on God and been faithful to serving God and doing it the way God said to do it. You husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church. Anybody here this morning? Is that not what God said? Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Are you wives being submissive to your husbands as God said? No, because he's not loving me like Christ loved the church. There's the answer. Being faithful to what God is required, not to what you and I think of. And so if we're going to do that, then we can be successful Amen. if we're faithful. Has your business failed? Have you lost all your money? Have you lost this? Have you lost that? What's your focus on? Being faithful to him and serving him, seeking to put him first in your life? Or all this other junk that we're talking about. God didn't say anything here. It is required. It's essential. It's necessary for stewards, you and I. It's not just a suggestion, you know. God would have said it's a suggestion, but it's a requirement. Amen. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. By the way, that a man is a women too. Yeah. Amen. Right. All of us. I see you wives out there. He's talking to men. He's not talking to me. He's talking to you. No, it's for all of us. Amen. Amen. And so everybody has failed in their Christian life except one person, Jesus Christ. Amen. You ever failed at anything? It may be the third point. What is the most important thing to our Lord? I think we've established that. Faithfulness. Now, if you're here this morning, you've been faithful to the Lord, you've been serving Him, then you may be more successful and less failure full than you think. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> it all depends on where our priorities are, amen? And so I want to look this morning at, now listen to this, play on, it's not really play on word, but I want to look this morning at some successful failures. We can be successful and still fail. Right. If we're faithful. It's all about being faithful, amen? And so somebody once said, if there's one thing I'm successful at, it's failing. Don't know who said it, but I can take that, amen? So let's look at some famous people this morning. Anybody know the name Isaiah? Feller in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter number 6, and as soon as they started singing that song, I just said, Lord, thank you. Because verse number 8 in Isaiah chapter 6 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You guys think God didn't into the music and the message this morning? Mm -hmm. Lines right up. Amen. Isaiah said, Who am I? Here am I, send me. You ever say that to the Lord? Lord, here am I. Don't care about success. Don't care about failure. Just want to be faithful. Here I am. I want to be faithful. Sir, here I am. Use me. We ever done that before? If we're being faithful, which is required, God will bless, will he not? Isaiah, you poor fella. God told Isaiah to preach to a very unpopular crowd an unpopular message. A message of repentance. I can preach a message of repentance and people will wiggle in their seats and get uncomfortable. It's just a message a lot of folks don't hear. Mm -hmm. And so preachers quit preaching it. But it's still in the Bible. Right. Except a man repent, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He cannot see heaven. Mm -hmm. It's part of salvation, is it not? So right from the beginning, God told Isaiah, look, I want you to go preach repentance, but they're not going to repent. Can you imagine preachers... The Lord tell him, I want you to preach this tomorrow on repentance, but nobody's going to repent, but I want you to preach it anyway. Yeah. I've had some of those messages that God's given me to preach, and I'm about, Lord, what do you, you want me to preach this to our people? Yeah, I want you to preach that to your people. <laughs> so Isaiah, I mean, he was already, they weren't going to repent. They weren't going to come to the Lord. They were only going to receive judgment. And so, you know, Isaiah was going to go on a suicide mission. Going to go do what God told him to and preach gospel of repentance, but they weren't going to repent. 
You think if he knew ahead of time, he might have quit? You think because they didn't repent and get saved when he did what God told him to, that maybe he thought he was a failure? Think about that. He failed to turn the nation of Israel to God. Maybe he considered himself a failure. I don't know. But when you think about it, how do we see Isaiah? You ever read the book of Isaiah? One of the greatest Hebrew writers in the Old Testament. Full of great things. Matter of fact, the verses that I was starting in chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on upon the throne, high and lifted up. Mm -hmm. And the seraphims had the six wings, and they bowed down before him and cried one to another. It brought Isaiah down to his knees. Caused him to understand that he was a wicked man like we are, amen? Jesus quoted Isaiah when he preached. Jesus quoted Isaiah. Now, in his mind, he may have been a failure. In Israel's mind, he may have been a failure. Nobody repented and came... But in God's mind, Jesus quoted him. Must have been something successful about him, amen? You know what it was? He was faithful. He served the Lord faithfully. Yeah. Preached repentance. No one came to the Lord. He kept on preaching. Kept on serving the Lord. John the Baptist quoted Isaiah from his text on repentance. So he was quoted by John the Baptist. Philip quoted him when he witnessed to the Ethiopian. Quoted from Isaiah. Paul used Isaiah five different times in Romans when he was preaching to the Gentiles about Christ. So if he was a failure, you couldn't prove it by me, amen? You couldn't prove it by these guys because they quoted him. The study of prophecy would be incomplete if we didn't have the book of Isaiah. And yet, a failure? Maybe in some people's eyes, maybe in Israel's eyes, maybe even in his own eyes, but not in God's eyes. He was not a failure. Why? Because he was faithful. Because he continued no matter what, he was faithful. And according to verse number 2 of chapter 4, that's what counts for God. Amen. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So Isaiah was faithful even though he failed to turn all of Israel. I mean, Israel's in limbo right now. God still hadn't gotten to him yet. Amen. What about Jeremiah? Anybody know about Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19. But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. You remember Jeremiah as a little kid, God called him, came, Want to be used of God, and God wanted to use him. Chapter 12, verse 6 says, For even thy brethren and the house of thy father, even they have dealt treacherously with thee. Yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto thee. And so Jeremiah was called by God as a young man, young preacher boy. It's tough on young preacher boys. It's even tougher today on young preacher boys. Uh, the devil, man, he'll lead them up. But by all human standards, Jeremiah was a failure in his ministry. You go book, read the book. The townspeople ordered him to leave town, or they would kill him. Is that successful? Everybody wants to get rid of you? Family rejected him because of his call to the ministry? I know a lot of boys got saved and got called to preach, and their families rejected him. Because that's not what mommy and daddy had planned for them. Because mommy and daddy had this successful path. God had a different path. Right. I could have gone to college on a baseball scholarship and been a pitcher and probably pitched for the Texas Rangers. <laughs> been successful. Showed Nolan Ryan how to know. <laughs> but God called me to preach. And so I took the other route, Amen. He was accused of treason. The authorities wanted to kill him. He was put into prison, in and out of prison, in and out of prison. Is that a success or a failure? Of course, Paul was put into prison. Peter was put into prison. John was put into prison. Were they all successful? Were they all failures? He wrote the book of Jeremiah. Anybody ever read the book of Jeremiah? 
But the king destroyed it. He cried and cried. So they call him what? The weeping prophet. Amen? Sounds like a failure, does it not? Failed in his ministry? Failed to be what he wanted to be? Or was he? Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What an honor. Jeremiah mm -hmm. and Jesus. When they thought of Jeremiah, they thought of Jesus. Is that a success? Is that a failure? They compared him to Jeremiah. Jesus to Jeremiah. Let me ask you a question this morning. Anybody in the people you know in your realm of friends ever mistaken you for Jesus? Have you let your light shine in such a way that they can say what they said to the disciples. They took note that they had been with Jesus. Anyone look at you and say, man, you must be a Christian because you're just like Jesus? What an honor. Why? Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, was Jeremiah a failure? Not in God's eyes. Jeremiah was not a failure in God's eyes. He may have thought he was a failure. Those around him may have thought he was a failure. But he was not a failure because he was compared to Jesus. And that's what we ought to be today, amen? We ought to be like Jesus. People ought to look at us, us and say, I can see Christ in you. Are we Christians? Christ-like? So should they be able to see Christ in us? If they can't, then maybe we're a failure. I don't know. Because that ought to be the goal of a child of God is to let our light shine. What? So that men may see your Father in you and glorify your Father in heaven. That ought to be our goal. Amen? So you're not a failure when others can see Jesus in you. When they know you're a Christian, you don't have to walk up to them and tell them. They know because your face says so. <laughs> Of course, now that we wear masks, we can't really tell these days, amen? Right. Say, well, those are Old Testament guys. What about some New Testament guys? Okay, how about Peter? Anybody know Peter? Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter number 26, verse 31. there in a day or so. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Did Peter deny the Lord? Mm -hmm. He's a failure! <laughs> and a liar. Yeah. I'll not deny you, Lord. I'll not deny you. You notice the Lord knew ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Imagine what must have went through Peter's heart. So yeah, he was a failure. You remember he took his eyes off the Lord and began to sink when he was walking on the water? Right. Was he a failure in walking on the water? Only when he took his eyes off the Lord. When he had his eyes on the Lord, he was successful. He was faithful when he took his eyes off the Lord. Then he began to sing. He rebuked Jesus when Jesus was talking about dying and being crucified. 
had more guts than I did. I wouldn't be able to stand the Lord and tell him things like that. Amen. He rebuked Jesus. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. How'd you like the Lord to say that to you this morning? Get behind me, Robert, you Satan. <laughs> no, he's not Satan, really. <laughs> He was the one when they got to the tomb that doubted. John ran on in there. He denied the Lord. Mm -hmm. Was he a failure? In our eyes, he was a failure, was he not? I mean, we see where he failed. In his eyes, when he denied the Lord and all these other things, he must have thought, man, I'm a first-class failure. Yeah. But I like the fact that he repented, went out and wept and repented, and got right with God. See, we can fail. We're going to fail. Things are going to happen. But the only time you really fail is when you fail to get back up and keep on going. When you allow the devil to get you down. Did Peter fail the Lord? Yeah, many times. Took his eyes off him, began to sink, denied him. All kinds of those things. But he didn't let it keep him down. He got back up. Right. Real failure only happens when we don't get back up. Amen. Peter didn't let the past get him or get in the way of the future. What did he do? When he preached, thousands came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He had those failures, but when he preached, thousands got saved that day. Amen. He wrote two books in the Bible. You ever read 1st and 2nd Peter? Good readings if you haven't. He was instrumental in that day in uh, founding the churches and getting people built up in the faith. And so Peter wasn't a failure. Why? Because he didn't let the failures defeat him. Amen. I denied the Lord. I may as well just go out and hang myself. <laughs> no. He went out and wept bitterly and repented. And God used him. Amen. And God can use us, amen? Listen to it again. Moreover, it is required in the steward that a man be found faithful. Not successful, not a failure, faithful. Which brings us to Jesus. Anybody know Jesus? Now maybe you consider yourself to be a failure. I don't know. Even Jesus, by the world standards was considered a failure. Think about it. He was executed as a criminal. Right. Two thieves, one on either side of him. Was he not him in the middle? Made all kinds of false accusations. He was condemned as a traitor to the Jews, calling himself king of the Jews, the son of God. He was rejected by his <laughs> own people, even some of his family. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our standards, Jesus would be a, a failure, would he not? And then when he died, all his followers fled. These guys that he'd been working with, praying with, training, called to be fishers of men, and when it got down to it, where were they? They all fled. And if that wasn't bad enough, he was a failure so bad that his father turned his back on him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he couldn't look on sin. He couldn't look on the sinless Lamb of God that took your sin and my sin upon him. And so when his father turned his back on him, what did he do? He quit. He gave up. He said, that's it. I'm done. No. In the garden when he prayed, he said what? Not my will, but thine be done. What's that? That's faithful. Faithful to the Father. No matter what he was going through, no matter what was happening, he was faithful to the Father. He would get off alone and pray to the Father. He would get off and serve the Father. He'll be all that being faithful to what God called him to do. Man's eyes, Christ was a failure. Until one morning up from the grave he arose. Yeah. And now he's ascended back into heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Make an intercession for you and I. One of these days, he's going to call us to come be with him. Amen. Is that a failure? No. Successful? Yes. Why? Faithful to the Father. Now we get down to where the rubber meets the road. Why? Oh, you. You and me. What about us? 
I guarantee you, I can almost with a 99.9% .9 accuracy say that all of us at one time or another have failed. Mm -hmm. if, if not in business, mm -hmm. if not in whatever, we failed God. Because we have to come in and confess our sins. Amen? Right. Now, does that make you a failure because you failed God? No. no. It does not. Unless you let those failures keep you from going on and serving the Lord. Unless you let those failures get in the way for what God wants you to be. Unless you just flat give up. You're not a failure. Right. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful for 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Now here's the thing. In one sense, we're all failures in that we're all sinners. We've all failed. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so because of that, we're on our way to hell if we're not saved. That's why Jesus Christ came. That's why he hung at Calvary. That's why he shed his blood to pay our sin debt. Adam and Eve failed in the garden, did they not? They disobeyed God. And so in that realm, we are failures. But <laughs> saved by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and so don't waller in self-pity. Woe is me. I failed. Would you, what, what would it be like if Christ died at Calvary? Put him in the tomb. The stone rolled away and everybody looked in and Jesus said, well, it's me, I failed you. <laughs> what must it be like when we waller in self-pity when God said, you've been made more than conquerors. Amen. You've overcome. Amen. It's when we dwell on our past mistakes, when we dwell on our past failures. It's when we let our failures defeat us. That's when we become a failure. Listen to me this morning. If you're saved, say amen. amen. If you're saved, you're a child of God. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And one of these days, Christ is going to come back and receive us to himself, and we're going to spend an eternity. He thinks you're so special, he went to build you a mansion. You get up there, and it's got Robert written right over the door, man. He just walk right into his mansion. What does he want us to do? Mope and grope and, oh, woe is me. I failed. You know what? If Ford had said that, we wouldn't have a car. Yeah. If Alexander Bell had said that, we wouldn't have telephones. Because how many times did they fail before those things became real? And if you're in Christ today, you are not a failure. Matter of fact, that brings us to our last point. God made you special. Say, I'm special. Some of you don't agree with that. <laughs> Do you know that you are worth a lot to God? Let me tell you how much you're worth to God. You are worth this much to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know how much you're worth to God? God's only begotten son loved you so much he came and died and paid your sin debt. He didn't have to do that. He went there and went through all that. The beatings and the crowning of thorns and the nails and the spear and the mockery and the spit and all that stuff. Because he loved you. You think he did that for failures? No, he did it so we would be faithful. He did it so that we could get saved and have a home in heaven. He did it because you're special. He did it because he loves you. And he was willing to sacrifice for you. Amen? He loves you so much he was willing to go through the torture on Calvary. You ever poke your finger with a thorn or something and say, ouch? I know you didn't say anything, but ouch. But say, ouch, how bad that little thorn hurt. Can you imagine a spike being driven through your hands and your feet? Is that not love? If that's not enough, then to ram a spear, have a spear rammed into your side, you're special. <laughs> Amen? 
God loves you. You're special. Lots of people just don't understand how much God loves them. You want me to prove from the Bible that you're special? Psalms 139, 14. Psalms 139, 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and then my soul knoweth right well. You are fearfully and marvelously made. Amen. God made you like you are and threw away the mold right. because you individually are fearful and wonderfully made. Now, granted, some are short. They're either sawed off or they got hammered down. Some are fluffy. I'm not fat, I'm just too short, by the way. Some are skinny, some are tall, some are short. Some are old, some are young, some are older, some are younger. We're all different. But in God's eyes, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You go back into Genesis and what he say? We are made in the image of God. I heard this last night on something, or I can't remember where I heard it now, but the guy was going through an art gallery, and he saw this picture, and, and he just looked at it, and he said, man, that is just the ugliest thing I've ever seen. And the artist, not the artist, but the guy running the art gallery come up and said, well, this is a picture by so-and-so, and it's beautiful. And the guy walked along a little further and looked up and said, this is the ugliest, ugliest thing I've ever seen. And the guy said, well, that's a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly is in the eyes of the beholder, amen? Listen to me this morning. Now, we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road. If you haven't been listening, wake up and listen now. God had a reason for making you the way you are. Amen. You heard the song, God, Don't Make No Mistakes? There are some that are shy and reserved. There are some that are outgoing. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> some are introverts, some are extroverts, some are handsome, some are so ugly only their mothers can love them, you know, some are smart, some are not so smart. And you've heard all of it. But however you are in that list, that's how God made you. Amen. He made you that way for a reason, a special reason. God has a purpose and a plan for every life here this morning. Amen? You may not like the way he made you. You may think that you're a failure. You may think, God, why couldn't you adjust my looks or my height or my character or my size? But your high character or size and all that doesn't make you a failure or a success. Because God made you the way God wants you to be. You are the way he wants you to be. And by the way, who gives you the right to question what God does? We have no right to question God and what he does. Romans 9.20. Romans 9.20. Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? No, we don't. We don't have a right to question God the way he made us. God knew before the foundations of the world who he was going to make and how he was going to make you. So don't question it, amen? And so success isn't determined by how you look. Otherwise, I'd be in a heap of trouble. Picking on me now. Success is not determined by how much you have. I know poor people that are more successful and happy than rich people. So it's not in how much you have. It's not how much success you have achieved in the world. Look at me. Just like that, God can take it all away. Just like that. He really doesn't have to have a spare. He can just think it. And it can all go away. God can take it, every bit of it away. You know why? Because he doesn't want you focused on success. He doesn't want you focused on failure. What does he want you focused on? Amen. It is required of a steward that he be found faithful. 
That's what God wants. God wants us to be faithful. It's required. You can't question it. It's required. Miss Rachel, in order for you to graduate in a couple weeks, are there some requirements you have to fulfill before you can graduate? There are, aren't there? Otherwise, she won't graduate. God's got some requirements for us. He requires that we be faithful. Not successful. Just faithful. He'll take care of the rest, will he not? Don't ever give up in your Christian life being faithful to God. No matter what you go through, no matter how life turns out, successful or failure, be faithful. Be faithful to God. Leave the final outcome to God. You're going to stand before him one day anyway, amen? Be faithful in your Bible reading every day. God said to study to show ourselves approved. God said to hide his word in our hearts that we might not sin against him. God said to make it a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Be faithful in reading it and, I hate to throw this out there, obey it. Yeah. Amen. We don't have a problem reading it. We have a problem obeying it. Be faithful in reading. Be faithful in obeying. Be faithful in your prayer life. Find you a closet somewhere and get in there and get along with God like God commanded, like God requires. Be faithful in your prayer life. You get to being faithful in Bible reading prayer life, you'd be amazed at some of the things that will happen. Right. God said you do it private, he'll reward you openly. Be faithful in serving him. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Be faithful in your giving, of your time, your talents, your tithe. That's what he's required of the stewards, is it not? That we be found faithful. Be faithful to pray for those things that you have no control over. Life's going to throw things at us that we have no control over. The devil's going to throw things at us that we have no control over. Be faithful and pray. Be faithful to trust God to do what only he can do. When you get to the point where you've done all you can do, and you haven't succeeded, and you haven't failed, you just haven't done nothing, trust God. What did he say? Trust God with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Amen. If you're being faithful, he will direct your path. Amen? Amen? Be faithful to do what God has called you to do. And sometimes God changes what he's called us to do. Whether it be that because we chose to do a different path than what he called us to do, or because we've done all that he's got us doing right here and he wants us to do something else. I know missionaries that God has taken them to fields and they've preached the gospel and done great work and then God has brought them back here to do a preach or to do whatever. Do whatever it is that God has called you to do and if he changes it, ask him, Lord, what is it you have me to do? What did Isaiah say? Guys, here am I. Send me. Be faithful to live like God has called you to live. Want to know how to live for God? Start being faithful and reading this and praying. God will show you. Amen. Be faithful to live as God has called you to live. It involves that word obey. I'm sorry. If you love me, keep. Okay. I just want to make sure you all know that first. Amen. Don't just do it. Do it today. Do it every day. Faithful. Faithful. It's required. Amen? Required. Let's stand with our heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I said at the beginning, I'll close with it, God measures success and failure differently than we do. He doesn't determine success or failure by comparing ours with others. God looks at success as faithfulness. Listen to these verses. And we'll give the invitation. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Paul said, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself 
to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. That is success in God's eyes. Forget the past, forget the failures, forget the successes, be faithful to God, focus on Him, seek to put Him first in your life today, and then you will have what is known as true success. Because you will do it God's way. It is required. It is essential. It is necessary. That you and I as God's children. As God's stewards. As his beloved. That we be found faithful. Some have come and prayed. Others if you need to come. The altars are here. You know your life. I don't know your life. I have enough to deal with in my life. Or have you been faithful? Or have you been basing your Christian life on this particular Christian, that particular Christian, this particular business, that particular business? How much money here? What ladder I can climb there? If you'll be faithful, if you'll be a faithful steward, God will take care of all that other stuff. He said he would supply all of our needs, did he not? He'll take care of it. He said to seek to put him first in our life. That's what we need to do. And all these things will be added unto you. What were the things that were added? Clothes, food, everything else God will take care of. But he wants us to be faithful to him. To be first in everything. Then we'll be successful. Peter had to come and confess that he denied the Lord and, and his lack of faith. And he confessed and repented. Then he went out and preached and 3,000 souls were saved. Did God use Peter after he failed? Yes. God used Peter. God will use you today. You'll just come to him. Get right with him. Turn your life over to him. And do what is required. Be faithful to him. You've been more than conquerors. You're overcomers. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Be faithful to him. I mean, after all, he was faithful when he went to Calvary to us, was he not? Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for the message today. We're thankful what we can learn in your word about being good stewards, about being faithful, about being what you've commanded us to be. I thank you for these that you have spoken to that have come. I pray that you will hear and answer their prayers. I pray, Father, that you will help all of us to examine ourselves. And to look and to make sure that we are being faithful stewards in every area of our life. We'll be careful to give you the praise because we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Be back tonight at 5 o'clock and I'll lay some more on you. Straight out of the Bible.